start by greeting each one of you in your time zones. Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon. On behalf of the organizers, that is the Lutheran World Federation, the Evangelical Church of the Lutheran Confession in Brazil, and the World Association for Christian Communication, I warmly welcome you to this public webinar. Our theme today is Hope Speech, Not Hate Speech, Addressing Hostility and Overcoming Divisiveness in the Public Space. My name is Pauline Mumia, and I am working at the LWF Office for Communication as a communication officer and theology and publications editor. It is indeed an honor for me to moderate the day's, today's conversations. But first, let's go to some instructions. The webinar will be conducted in English with simultaneous interpretation into two languages, that is Portuguese and Spanish. To listen to your language of choice, please click on the interpretation icon. It's at the bottom of your screen at the far right. It's got a globe. And to listen to your language of choice, please click on choose either Spanish or Portuguese. Also to enable us to participate fully in this webinar, I would also like to invite you to introduce yourselves in the chat box. That is as long as you're comfortable doing so. You can mention your name, the role or position you hold in your organization, the organization that you represent and the country that you come from. The chat box may also be used to ask questions or to respond with comments during this webinar. Just to remind you that this webinar will be recorded and that recording will be made available online once it is ready. But in order to benefit from the learning that this event obviously offers, docu its documentation will follow the Chatham House rules, which I hope many of us are familiar with. That is discussion in the chat box may be shared, but the identity of the person who shared that information should not be revealed. It is because we would like to keep this as a safe space for participants to also engage with one another. Let me say a few words on why the organizers of this webinar settled on the theme, hope speech, not hate speech. Many of us are aware that the rising phenomenon of hate speech in social media is alarming. It is actually rare to come across people from different walks of life holding calm and respectful discussions about social cohesion in the public space. And when it comes to religious opinions, most of the news reports often focus on what would increase exclusion. The aim of this webinar, therefore, is for us to hear insights and lessons on how to address hate speech in the public sphere from a Christian perspective. Now, having given this brief introduction and hoping that all of you are clear on the technical aspects, let me say that we have four fantastic speakers. And I would like to invite our first speaker who will give us some opening remarks to frame our conversations today. Our first speaker is Jocelyn Fuller. Jocelyn is the Senior Director of Strategic Communications at the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America that the ELCA offices are based in Chicago. And now I would hand over to Jocelyn to take us through her opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you to the Lutheran Federation for inviting me to speak today about a topic we're all dealing with each and every day, not only in our professional lives, but our personal lives as well. Uh, as you heard, I'm Jocelyn Fuller. Uh, I'm the Senior Director of Strategic Communications for the ELCA. We're a church of about 9,000 worshiping communities um, with about 30, uh, 3,500, um, 3.5 million, excuse me, members across the United States and the Caribbean. Um, our communications team is at the head office in Chicago, and we're the storytellers of the organization. We share the good news across multiple channels each and every day. Um, it's really no secret 
that we're living in turbulent times everywhere, right? The United States, like many countries, we're not only dealing with a pandemic of this magnitude for the first time, but we're also facing civic unrest, racial and social injustice, among so many other things. There is a divide in this country that most of you probably know is really palpable for a lot of us. Um, and it's played out over and over and over again in the social media feeds of every American online in every TV screen. And part of sharing the good news, as you all know, is reading the comments and the feedback. Uh, the social media channels of the ELCA have seen more hate speech in the last year than we've probably ever seen. Our social media following is growing in double digit percentages across the board in the pandemic, which is great news. But with those followers, um, especially for us, we see a church that's reflective of our divided nation. Um, so how do we deal with all of that? <laughs> I would say um, very, very carefully is how we deal with it. Um, our, our social media team is a group of rock stars. We, um, they're people who feel called to the ministry of this work and take the responsibility of promoting and nurturing respectful dialogue online very seriously. Uh, we're also lucky to have followers and members who work to promote respectful dialogue on our posts. Oftentimes we find that our followers kind of referee each other. And it doesn't take long for folks to recognize troll online or shut down any sign of hate speech. We also monitor our posts carefully, hide posts that are inappropriate, and we'll block individuals who are offensive. And most importantly, we see ourselves as the resource to provide links to the social teachings of our church, to Lutheran theology, or policies that maybe are asked for in the comments or that we feel will help nurture that conversation. And I think lastly, when it comes to social media and when it comes to any communications that we do for and on behalf of the church, we work hard to ground our our posts, our pastoral letters, our statements in those same social teachings, policies, and in our Lutheran theology. That becomes such an important part of really working towards fighting that hate speech and really turning it into hope speech. Um, but dealing with the hate speech is just one part of the equation. The other piece and the work that's truly life-giving for all of us is creating a space for hope especially online. When the pandemic started, we all had to pivot quickly and think about communications in new ways. And as the days and weeks passed, we were all craving hope in our lives. So we dialed up a few of our strategies, a couple of notches. We launched a few new things to encourage and promote hope across the church and beyond. Um, since probably April of 2020, Presiding Bishop Eaton has been releasing a video message to the church across all of our social media channels every Friday. Uh, each week brings a new message of hope, often in sync with current events. Um, we've done everything from publicly condemn white supremacy, condemn anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim bigotry, where there have been messages of prayer to those involved in the police shootings. We've even filmed Bishop Eaton getting her first COVID vaccine. These videos get more views than most of the videos we produced in previous years. And most of them are filmed through Zoom, just like this, the bishop in her living room. We also work hard to tell the stories of hope happening all across the church. Members and ministries finding ways during these hard times to share the good news of Jesus Christ with their neighbors. We share those stories in all formats and all channels that I mentioned previously. Lastly, we ask the church to share stories with us. Through the hashtag ELCA Church Together, our members, congregations, and other ministries took storytelling into their own hands and shared their stories with us. And we, and we in turn shared those with our followers. Turning hate speech into hope speech is not an easy task. Uh, we certainly don't have all the answers, but we try every day in our context to encourage meaningful, thoughtful, and respectful dialogue across all of our channels. I really look forward to learning from everyone today on this call. And I really thank you for the invitation again and for listening and learning a little bit more about the communications work that we're doing at the ELCA. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jocelyn, for these remarks. 
for this opening insights. And now I will move to our next group of speakers. Today, we've actually opted for a more conversational approach for the next team of speakers, rather than focusing on presentations per se. As I said earlier, our speakers come from different contexts and different professional backgrounds, which gives us the advantage, as we've heard from the ELCA, to gain insights from a variety of perspectives. Of course, keeping to a primary focus on how to address hate speech in the public sphere from a Christian perspective. And each of the three speakers that follow will begin with opening remarks, which, and then we'll sort of get into a free flow conversation between all of us, which you as participants are free to join, again, by asking questions or giving comments in the chat. And now I will move to our first speaker on this list. That is Mr. Philip Lee, who is General Secretary of the Toronto-based World Association for Christian Communication, or WORK. WORK is a non-government organization that builds on communication rights with the aim to promote social justice. But then I will let Philip tell us more about WORK and about his work. Over to you, Philip. Thank you, Pauline, and thank you, LWF, for this marvellous uh, webinar on such an important topic today, which really is about trust in public voices. WSCC is an international NGO that specialises in the, the right to communicate, which in terms of media, including social media, has to do with freedom of expression, accessibility, affordability and, and balance. Our own WAC Europe region, who are members of the global organization, have recently reported on a project which was called Breaking Down the Social Media Divides. The report is available on their website. It came out in 2020, and I'll put the link into the chat uh, a little bit later. But it was a project on communication rights, and it focused on hate speech and hateful content, as it were. And it was based on the principle that all people have the right to live in dignity, free from discrimination. This applies everywhere, including in our online interactions. And I wanted just to quote from the report um, because it sets the scene as it were for what WAC is trying to do, but I think what all of you are trying to do as well. Encountering hate and division online can be distressing and hurtful. Sometimes we try to engage in conversation. Sometimes we avoid an online argument. But as social media has become a fixed feature of our lives, we as individuals and as communities need to find ways to break down divides, to build or rebuild conversation, and to promote diversity and respect online. Now, you all know that this is very important and um, in a sense you wouldn't be here if you didn't think it were. Um, but I just wanted to open out the, the framework just a little bit um, to say that there are, of course, different public media spaces, including social media, including the online presence that we're so familiar with. We should remember that while online communication plays a key role today, there are other ways in which discrimination and incitement take place. We all remember, for example, the impact of provocative cartoons in the newspapers, magazines. But there is another repeated uh, exposure to images and narratives that denigrate and that have a cumulative effect on people's responses to events. I'll give you just a couple of examples um, of the way I'm thinking about this. Uh, from 1994, way back now, but um, fresh in our minds still probably, was the role played by Radio Mil Colin in Rwanda during the genocide. This was a government owned radio station that spewed out hate on the radio waves there. And then another, which is less familiar perhaps, and this comes from a book called Real Bad Arabs, real spelled R-E-E-L because it refers to cinema and film. Um, 
a, a researcher called Jack Shaheen analyzed a thousand films that had Arab and Muslim characters and were produced between 1896 to 2000. So a whole range of films. And out of which he found that a great majority, 936 titles in all, were negative in their portrayal of Arabs. He showed that the slander of Arabs in American filmmaking has existed since the early days of the silent film era, right through to 2006 when the study concluded. My question is this, what is the social and political impact of repeatedly seeing or reading about or hearing about the denigration and humiliation of a particular group of people. Because what we're seeing is social media as tool, as an instant way of spreading hate, of spreading division, of criticizing, of being pointed. But in fact, it may be that the whole idea about denigration, humiliation, incitement to violence lies much deeper. And we also have to address that aspect of the problem as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. And now we will move to our next speaker, Clara, Clara Baliza, Baliza. Clara is coordinator of the Department for Ecumenical and Foreign Relations at the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Hungary with its head office in Budapest. Over to you, Clara. Thank you, Pauline, and I also thank you for the opportunity to, to join this interesting conversation. And although I work in the church, I was originally trained as a linguist, and I do a lot of work with language and texts in my present job too. So this is why I would like to approach today's issue from a linguistic point of view. And please forgive me for being a bit theoretical at the beginning, but I promise I'll move on to a practical example at the end. The linguistic analysis of hate speech has included corpus-based studies and applied linguistic methods to analyze utterances and determine to what extent they fulfill the criteria of hate speech. And in particular, hate speech can be studied in the light of the so-called speech act theory, which is a quite influential theory of linguistics from the 20th century. And it understands language primarily as a performative act. That is, we do not simply describe things with language, but we actually do something with it. And linguists working in this frame, framework differentiate between three forces at work in each utterance. There is a so-called locutionary force, which refers to the actual content or meaning of an utterance. And then we have the illocutionary force is what the speaker intends to do with the utterance. We can think of promises, offers, explanations, and so on as examples. And then on the third level, we have the perlocutionary force, which is the effect of the utterance on the listener. And this effect may manifest itself in feelings, beliefs, or behaviors. This is obviously an extremely narrow overview of this theory, but you probably have noticed that it can be applied to hate speech quite well because when a derogatory utterance is spoken or written, it is rarely a descriptive statement. In fact, the truth value of such a sentence is not really a matter of interest. What we are talking about is a performative act. Apart from the meaning, the locutionary force, hate speech utterances also have an illocutionary force that is an intention behind them. And these intentions might differ from unconscious ones, such as airing frustration, expressing disappointment of fear, seeking attention or creating order in a universe of uncertainties to consciously evil ones, when someone intentionally, intentionally tries to threaten or silence others or incite hatred. So in my opinion, one important question in handling hate speech is whether we can actually recognize these intentions and address them accordingly. And finally, we can postulate that hate speech utterances have perlocutionary force, that is, they evoke thoughts and feelings in the listener and can also lead to certain behaviors. Such feelings obviously include fear, 
humiliation or desire to retaliate on the part of those whom hate speech is directed at, or anger, a sense of forced pride or self-assurance on the part of the like-minded listener. And too often we see examples of hate speech leading up to concrete action against a target or a target group. Yet being a linguist by training, but working actively in the church, I would not like to completely ignore the Christian dimension either. One particular interface I see between the subject matter of linguistics and theology is the word, God as the word. Because the Bible is full of examples telling us that God's word is living and active. It is not meant to describe the state of affairs or to provide food for philosophical argumentation about its truth value. It is meant to perform an act, to create, to heal, to forgive sins, to bring back to life, to bring down walls, to free from chains, to institute a sacrament, to finish all that is needed for our salvation. So in the face of all this disruptive language, I don't think the church can offer any foolproof solutions or best practices, but we have the hope that God's word, God's language prevails. And we, the church, are entrusted with the task to make sure that this word is heard as clearly as possible. As I've promised, I would like to refer to an ecumenical initiative from my own country, which I can see as a genuine attempt to counter hate speech and lift up respectful interaction between people and groups. The network of Christian Roma colleges in Hungary has just celebrated its 10th anniversary. Now, Roma people have long been a marginalized group in Hungary. Their life is challenged by high unemployment, bad living conditions and low education level, and as a result, also high rates of criminalism and substance abuse. This in turn, fewer the prejudices deeply rooted in the majority society. These factors have made this group a perfect target of hate speech and in fact hate crime. In, 19, uh, in 2008 and 9, a number of violent incidents occurred in Hungary that actually left six Roma people dead. So in the face of this burning issue, 10 years ago, four churches, the Reformed Church, Metropolitan Greek Catholic Church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church and the Jesuit Order on behalf of the Roman Catholic Church established a network of Christian Roma colleges. The aim is to provide opportunities for disadvantaged students to enter tertiary education and to promote, to promote the formation of a qualified, open, dedicated group of people with Roma and Christian identity. It offers mentoring, housing and scholarships to students. At the same time, the colleges also welcome non-Roma students if they need similar help. This way, the network also contributes to breaking down the walls between the different social groups. Over the 10 years, the number of the colleges has grown from 4 to 11, and together they have had 470 graduates. And actually, some of those alumni are now my college colleagues at the church-wide office, and I honestly feel, feel honored to know them. In a recent documentary, they talked about their background, their achievements and their thoughts on how to stop prejudice and hatred. And one of the young men said that a group friend of his comes from a family where hate speech against Roma was the norm. The two of them ended up as roommates and their interaction made them realize that they had things in common. And to finish off, I would like to quote the words of another young man from this film. Hatred must be learned too. So why can't we just do a different learning process? Get rid of those ready-made boxes and look at each other as individuals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clara, for the practical examples you brought from Hungary and starting off us in that discussion that we'll take up later. And now I'll move to our last speaker in this group, who is Renato Valenga. I hope I pronounced your name right. Renato is a Brazilian journalist. He's also a youth leader at the Evangelical Church of the Lutheran Confession in Brazil, headquartered in Porto Alegre. Over to you, Renato. Hello, everyone. Good morning from, from Brazil. 
my name is Renato Valenga. I'm a journalist and also a youth leader at the Evangelical Church of the Lutheran Confession in Brazil. I take this moment to greet my dear colleagues who are also uh, sharing their perspectives here today, as well as the organizers of this important event. And of course, all of the participants who showed up today. I would like to start by saying that addressing hate speech on social media is a complex and challenging assignment. Yet it is extremely important to discuss the impacts of this phenomenon. And it is also a call to action for all of us, religious and secular leaders, politicians and activists, and also for social media users of all ages. This conversation is in uh, an intergenerational and crucial one which is why we need to create spaces of dialogue like this, where people have the chance to learn more about the subject, reflect on it, and perhaps rethink their relationship with social media platforms. Not long ago, we used to think that we had something like two different lives. The virtual one, which used to be only a small part of our daily activities, and the real one, which was everything that happened while the computer was off. Well, with all the technology that has rapidly evolved in the last, let's say, 15 years, we now have the online versions of ourselves constantly present with us when we work, study, hang out with family and friends, when we are feeling happy, sad, angry, or in love. And one might say that the internet did not create hate speech. Yes, one is right about that. Nevertheless, hate speech has become an issue that affects the dignity and the rights of people online and offline, as we will discuss later on in this webinar. According to data from SaferNet, an NGO that promotes human rights on the internet in Brazil, more than 3 million reports related to hate crimes online have been documented since the organization was founded in 2005. The main targets of such crimes are Black people, Indigenous people, women, and the LGBTQ plus community. These numbers are indeed concerning. However, we are aware that much of the hate on social media is still not documented, and this number could be much bigger. The UNESCO, United, Nation, uh, United Na uh, Nations uh, Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, released a document last year addressing what they call disinfodemic to discuss a disinformation pandemic that came along with uh, COVID-19. I would say that here in Brazil, this disinfodemic had arrived a little earlier with a huge wave of disinformation that has increased over the last years. Just to mention one example, the presidential election in 2018 was famous for its use of this information as a tool to undermine and attack candidates and their political agenda. A lot of the disinformation is tragedy aimed at religious people in Brazil, especially Catholics and evangelicals, creating, for example, the false idea that some kind of anti-Christian agenda was created in the country and then presenting a candidate, a messiah, as the only savior of such misfortune. Since then, denial and disinformation have become a challenging reality in Brazil. Now, distrust and conspiracy theories stimulated by high-level politicians and their supporters are still leading people to condone hateful discourses against minority groups. See, many of those people tend to believe they are doing the right thing based on disinformation and false assumptions that they see on their social media accounts every day, content that is generally created and shared by robots using personal data of users and algorith uh, algorithms to reach the right audiences. This concept of bubble and its relate, uh, relation to the way social media platforms operate their business model, having serious consequences to societies such as extreme polarization, lack of empathy and prejudice, all of this should be openly discussed. And I believe we could address that later as well. As observed, this information tends to lead people to hateful views and actions. Allow me to quote one of the documents of UNESCO that discusses online hate speech. It says, 
Ignorance is a common thread connecting online and offline hate speech. The lack of information, either, either intentionally or unintentionally, leads to people adopting narrow worldviews that may accommodate hateful views of others. There is not enough online education literacy, meaning we are just giving the devices without knowing how they work and how they will affect the way we think and behave. We should have a more critical view of social media and raise awareness of how such apps affect the way we see the world somehow. By having a more rational approach, we will also be able to spot hate speech content more easily, report it when it happens, and also put pressure on internet intermediaries to act more strongly against hate speech online. Uh, well, that was a short overview of the subject, and I'm sure we have a lot uh, to learn and to talk about during the discussion. Um, and I'm so glad we are having this conversation today. Thank you. And now I'll hand over to Sivin for the remaining part of the conversation. For the next you, part Pauline. of our conversation, Sivin. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Pauline, for, for doing this. And uh, I want to thank the Office of Communications from the LWF, which Pauline is the communications officer for just moderating the, the early part of this discussion. So we'll come back to you later, Pauline, as you wrap things up later. Thank you. So we've, we've had uh, uh, quite some interesting opening remarks from, uh, from Clara, from Philip, and also Renato. And I can see from the chat that people are introducing themselves from different parts of the world. So we want to just welcome all of you. And one of the things that came up, I think was very interesting. And I want to start it off with Philip because uh, you, you gave a very short introduction. And uh, Philip, one of the questions was, is there a general definition? I mean, is just hate speech like uh, anything, you know, anything goes? I, I don't think so, right? So there is a specific understanding of what hate speech is all about. Could you just help unpack that and maybe link to that uh, from hate speech to hateful content or hate crimes, you know, this word hate, some people seem to react to it and they're more, not so comfortable with the word. Yeah, um, I mean, hate speech is, is shorthand, I think. It, 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 it's an umbrella term, covers a, a lot of sins, let's say. Um, it tends to um, have repercussions in terms of incitement to violence because there is that clash, I think, between hate speech and freedom of expression. Where do the two overlap? Where is there a dividing line and so on? But a lot of um, uh, reaction to hate speech has to do with whether, whether it can be uh, defined as criminal or not. So that if you actually incite, well, as happened in Rwanda, of course, if you can actually pinpoint uh, extensive use of hate speech uh, media to incite violence against another group of people, then it becomes a, a criminal activity. I think the problem with social media is that they're largely unregulated. So, of course, it's very difficult to say, well, that is genuine hate speech and it had these repercussions to, to join up the, do the dots between the, the language action, the linguistic action, as it were, what it meant and its repercussions in terms of actions, uh, attacks on other people. It's a minefield in a way because um, people don't agree on, on the term or, or quite how it should, should be used. I'm just wondering from Clara's point of view, or even Renato, I mean, you can speak to each other as well. I mean, this is a conversation amongst us. Uh, I mean, how, how, what does it look like uh, uh, in your countries? I know you, uh, Renato mentioned a little bit earlier, but Clara, how about you? Uh, obviously, the dilemma that Philip has just mentioned that, that there is this uh, different, uh, difficult connecting line between the actual utterance to use the linguistic term now. And, and what actually happens as a result is really unclear. And the, uh, also the different countries and the different conventions have uh, different, uh, uh, different cultures, have different sensitivities. And, uh, and uh, this is one of the big dangers, I guess, in, in, in public space and in political uh, space that if, if this uh, threshold of sensitivity is raised too high, then 
you, you don't recognize uh, the, the utterances as, as hate speech or you don't find it dangerous anymore. And, and then maybe the consequence comes much, much, much later and in, in a faraway place. Uh, and it's already difficult to, to connect the two. So that is why also in this philosophical thinking where they start thinking about whether, whether hate speech is actually only mere speech or it is actually the, the act itself, uh, there are different, different schools and different viewpoints and they have di different repercussions into legislation as well, which Philip has already pointed out. If I may, I, I think this is precisely yes, why I tried at the beginning to open it out a bit because Renato pointed to something very important. He said, media literacy is part of the key to this. If young people and others don't actually understand how to read the media, how the media is constructed, how they operate, uh, the finances behind them, all that, um, then they don't really grasp what's going on. And this is true of social media. But it is also that larger framework where um, if, if you can't read the media, meaning understand what perspectives, what representations you are being given through the screen, technically everything now comes across the internet through our computers, but I'm also talking, as I say, about films. If you don't spot what's going on, then that reinforces your prejudices, your misunderstandings, your misperceptions. Renato, that's a good point for you to just come in, especially from a young person's perspective as well. Yes, I think, think that mm -hmm. um, I also think that this issue with the definition of uh, freedom of speech, for example, in the differences that different uh, interpretations that people give to that. And if you compare, for example, what uh, Americans from uh, North America uh, and South America think of freedom of speech and what maybe uh, other countries think of it, um, it may differ and then people fi find it hard to say, hey, this is a fr uh, hate speech or just plain people uh, communicating on the internet. And another thing is that I also believe that uh, sometimes things are created um, in steps. So uh, I was just reading about how memes, for example, and there was uh, in this material at UNESCO, there are examples of people using me uh, memes on the internet to somehow attack uh, groups of indigenous people in Australia. And maybe you see a meme and you think it's funny and okay, you uh, don't see the harm uh, inside it, but it is like just serves as a fuel and then you see another thing and another article and another post. And when you see your uh, view, your point of view about that subject is completely uh, altered and then prejudice and hate becomes like very easily uh, at hand. So I think that it's uh, hard to just spot what the definition, but I agree that the best solution would have media literacy. So you are able to empower people to recognize, even if it's subtle, uh, recognize what could be a potential uh, fuel um, to, to hate speech. And what's interesting here, as Renato, you're talking and I'm listening now, it's that while we may be arguing about the definitions and there are some suggested definitions, obviously, uh, about whether it's inciting hatred, uh, violence, uh, as well as uh, maybe a stereotype of, other, of others. Um, I, I was just wondering, uh, is it more about the effect and of course how people may misuse it uh, or the kind of environment that we're in? It's like creating, right, because of our speech, we're creating an environment that's unsafe for people to participate. So we want to have a civil discussion and even disagreement, but now we're in an environment that has become quite difficult because of how people use the media and what is put out there and, and possibility of being anonymous or getting away with it. I don't need to face that person. I can just say what I want. I mean, the Archbishop in the Church of Sweden recently had to just take a break from the internet, from Twitter, because of so much uh, negativity thrown at her. So I'm just trying to broaden this and painting it out more, more concretely. Uh, what thoughts do you have about this in terms of uh, this environment, uh, that media environment that we're in? Anyone? 
put to chip into that. Perhaps Philip, that's your, your area of expertise. It, it is. Um, I think we've suffered over the last um, 10 years. Um, I'm going to name names, so, you know, forgive me if I offend anybody. Um, you know, with Trump as president of the United States, he has seized the media. He began before being president, seizing the media by having his own um, presence, as it were. But then with Fox News and everything that followed, um, if you have a government that actually controls media, it controls media representations, but it also seeks to control the way people think. And therefore it controls the policies that they vote for. If you make a case in the public media, if you're a government, you make the case in the public media that as the example was given, the Roma people are less than human. However you do it, you create a picture of them as being less than human. Then you can create a slippery slope of policy making that not only denigrates these people but removes their their dignity that removes their privileges that actually harms them you don't have to kill them you can actually do it by just making things really bad for the for their lives livelihoods and their children and so on but perhaps i can be a devil's advocate here and just ask um clara because as i understand it and the media in hungary are pretty well government controlled and I, I wonder what your perspective on, on that is from the point of view of this issue of uh, mentally oppressing other people, denigrating other people. I mean, it seems to be very important. Well, it is definitely true that, that the media and uh, the media is not so polarized, but the Hungarian society is. Uh, so, um, yeah, actually, in, in with respect to Roma right now, so this is an issue that that I think has been uh, acknowledged and realized that this this must must not must not happen. So, um, uh, so the Roman people actually have a better status right now, as as the the focus is being turned on different groups uh, in the media, depending on 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 who that uh, enemy should be. Uh, and 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 you're right that the, me the the power of media is is very strong in that uh, sense because if if you you can you can have access to to one side of the arguments only, then it has at least two effects. One of them is that people uh, people don't don't see a diverse picture, uh, people don't get personal experience, and and then the other thing is that as a response. You need to be, you need to be much more, uh, much sharper yourself. So, so, and that that is then the other range that you that you 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 speaking up or raising your voice. You can't do it without without actually playing along, right? So, so if you go into the same same um, mainstream flow or use the same methods. As as a uh, as a uh, the mainstream media is using, so this is this is where where it becomes really difficult for for everyone and and for the churches as well and and also because and there was one one comment here that I just really briefly wanted to to um, address that we have to we have to really talk to the people who who in, uh, who use hate speech and. If we are honest with ourselves, we don't know how many of them are members of our own communities, religious communities or churches. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then it becomes again quite difficult, right? So we, we tend to speak about hate speech as if it was, okay, it, it's not us, it's them there again doing hate speech and, and we, are, we are trying to stop it, right? We are only the ones that look at it. But what happens if there are also some of us who actually do it right and with what in what context and what are my words that might be understood as other by uh, by others as, as as hate speech so that's again a very complex issue here yeah and clara this is interesting because like for some church members they might say you know jesus used very harsh words and then lutherans i think we're quite guilty of uh martin luther being quite insulting in the way he he spoke, you know, and maybe in the context of this hate speech discussion, then they're wondering, you no, know, uh, is there something wrong for us to speak the truth, to just have something that is, 
you know, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? And maybe Renato, I'll pull you in afterwards, you know, just to hear your thoughts. Because on one hand, we are called to be prophetic. We want to speak truth power, right? So there's an element of uh, not being nice. There are times you're not supposed to be nice, but when it's not being nice, becoming hate speech or harmful, uh, perhaps you, uh, you have some thoughts on that. And others can come in anytime, sure, of course. Clara, your thoughts, that Jesus, harsh words. Some members might think, I'm, I'm just following Jesus. You know, I'm talking to... Yes, and, and then it becomes... It it becomes okay freedom of speech and then you have to have to link the next aspect freedom of religion the freedom of, of practicing one's religion and and uh, and uh, and you have this sense of of of, uh, of mission and and strong uh, convictions and then you can say okay to what extent am i allowed am i not allowed to confess my faith so i completely agree with Sivin that uh, that it is uh, that it is really difficult, especially um, in uh, maybe more conservative uh, circles. Uh, I intentionally don't want to use the word fundamentalist because it's not fundamentalist issue. It's it's, uh, it's practically our our attitude to to the Bible, to to the word of God, to the word of God. Uh, again, whether we we consider to what extent do we take the context into consideration, but that's again not my. The uh, territory of expertise, like contextual hermeneutics or whatever, so <laughs> so I leave that to the um, to the theologians to to come to terms with that. Good luck with it. Yeah. So Renato, good luck with it. Uh, so ah. what, what does so <laughs> how, how does that so, so what do you think? I mean, what does it mean for you guys right now in Brazil? Yeah, I will share some of my thoughts. But yeah, as, uh, as uh, Clara said, it's uh, complicated. But I would say that it depends. Like, I, I think that if you want to be have a strong voice and change things and try to follow Jesus, that's one thing. But uh, what's your goal? Is your goal to segregate and hate? That Would that be what Jesus would do? So uh, uh, I think that seeking for justice and talking about the issues of society uh following what jesus would do is one thing but you need to see how your actions um have an affection in in society so if it's hate and segregation then i don't believe that's what jesus would do so and uh i just want to uh use this opportunity to address the fact that here in brazil uh, the religion, the religion is being used uh, for political projects and political um, ideologies or goals. So um, that's, uh, for example, here in, uh, I just recently saw a report. Uh, it was a video of people uh, on the streets. And the question was, uh, will you uh, get the vaccine? And a lot of people answered that they wouldn't because uh, the vaccine, uh, the vaccines have microchips that will control them. And they justified this action saying that they are religious, they believe in God, and that is enough. So they shouldn't do anything else because God will protect them against the, the virus without the vaccine. So you see how dangerous this is. So this is one, one example of how people of faith here in Brazil are being played. And um, yeah, this uh, political use creates room to amplify these hateful ideas and uh, polit political projects of exclusion and systematic prejudice. And they are using the name of God to do that. But in fact, this is not what uh, religions uh, seek for. And it's more of a, a political agenda and ideology and less of religion but unfortunately unfortunately they played so well with uh, the, those words and they present themselves as saviors as uh, also protectors of the decent people so and here in brazil the christians are seen as uh, they they like to be seen as the decent people different from the uh, the, the rest of the the world so it plays well in people's ears and uh, also with this whole uh, and, and maybe I, I, we can, could talk specifically more about that later. Uh, this whole dynamic with uh, 
how the, your feed work and how you access uh, social media posts. This uh, all helps you to create the enemy. And then you suddenly see, okay, so I need to go with this guy here because the, the situation is uh, terrible in Brazil. So he's the savior. I'm going to trust he'll do the best in the name of God. But in fact, that's the other way around. It's very interesting, uh, Renato, you're pointing out something a little bit behind the scenes. And I think, Philip, you alluded to that also earlier, is that uh, the corporations behind, you know, the clickbaiting, uh, there are other aspects of this that actually it is, you know, someone once said that if it doesn't hurt, it won't sell, you know, uh, you know it's that kind of thing. So I'm just wondering, uh, do you all have any reflections? On, we've talked about the church, we talked about individuals, their responses, uh, more cultural discussions. Uh, now, uh, perhaps even... Uh, there's legislation now. I mean, in the last one year, we saw Facebook taking down um, certain uh, posts or whether it's groups that are closed. So it's really a complex tension between freedom of speech or Twitter. And the most famous uh, person's Twitter account is, is, is he's banned from Twitter. So things like that. Uh, and yet we are also using this right now. Even now we are using... Zoom, and then we are probably going to tweet about today's session and we want to share it. So there's the other side of it. So what's this relationship we have with these media companies behind the scenes? So that's a great question, I think. Um, the answer does come back in part to regulation and therefore mm -hmm. legislation, I think. And your example there, Sivin, is actually very apt. I, 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 I did a little bit of research in preparation for this, as I know my colleagues did. Um, there was a, an article in the in the Guardian um, last week, and um, it said that basically any law on obscenity, libel, or dangerous speech that applies to the Guardian newspaper would also apply to Facebook. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, that's a very um, important point, isn't it? Because the question came, well, doesn't that mean that Facebook would then have to censor a lot of content? And the answer was yes, but that's not the point. The point is, if you can say it, is it, sorry, the point is not, if you can say it, you can type it into a computer and put it out on social media, because what you can say anonymously is not the same as what you can say publicly when identifiable. So the argument is, if the Guardian can't publish it. Facebook can't publish it either. That's the point. Because somebody has to carry the can. Somebody has to take responsibility for what's out there. And of course, Facebook, we have to remember, is a commercial company making an immense amount of money out of people's data about all this kind of stuff. They also have a responsibility for what they allow to be put up and what they don't allow, what they take down in that sense. And that, I think, is part of the answer to this problem of, we're still calling it hate speech, of course, but. Uh. <laughs> yeah. And Clara, I noticed that you, you may have something to add to that. No, it just came to my mind that probably one of the basic problems behind all of this is that we as human beings are, we just want to communicate. We want to be heard. And because we are not heard in the offline world, uh, there is this compulsion that we must express our opinion I must say something. It can't be that I don't have an opinion about something and I'm free to, to spread. So somehow maybe an other way where we could go is, is not just like, apart from stopping hate speech, talking to the people and so on, is to teach ourselves and teach the world to fall silent, that it's not a problem if you don't say anything sometimes. So I would just stop. Thank you. Now, I think it might be good for us not to just dwell on the hate part of this topic. We, our uh, title is hope speech and not hate speech. And I think that is really what we are trying to get at. Uh, what, how do we counter this or how do we plant other ways of thinking, seeds of thought? I, I like the agricultural metaphors, right? Planting seeds, nurturing. But of course, we use the word like countering hate with hope. So uh, let's go to that direction. Now, what are some ways that you have seen that are really helpful for us to have a different way of engaging the media, uh, whether it's social, mass media or otherwise? I'd love to hear examples and lessons learned from you 
and even whether it's your personal church or otherwise, um, anyone can go first. And Renato, I know because you, you did a nice YouTube video with someone about diversity. Maybe we can start with you. Uh, yes, of course. That would, that would be a good example. Yeah. 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 So I think that the, the, maybe the fastest thing we could do and the first thing would be uh, raise awareness and advocate for uh, this type of information. Like people should know how everything works and also they should understand that as Clara said, you don't always need to, you know, make a statement about everything. So uh, because with social media, and that's also part of the dynamic of it, you receive something and it's almost like an obligation for you to like put your opinion about that. And it, it's instantly and it's fast. And sometimes you don't think it through or you haven't seen another uh, perspective on that and you just assume that you are right about that and you will post and you will share and this reaches people um, when we say okay we are just posting uh, that for personal friends and family that's not right we know that uh, social media content spreads and it's hard to control what you say so I would say that the first uh, thing people should do is learn and understand how how the the, the platforms that we use are uh, making us creating instant uh, opinions about things and then learning how to hold back, think it maybe twice or three times or more if necessary before saying something and check information uh, because also uh, it's funny how maybe posts are using journalistic narratives or uh, journalistic uh, styles of uh, um, writing pieces to sell opinions as new. So I think that we also should learn how to differ uh, differentiate opinion and effect. And uh, sometimes people just read things and think, okay, this is a news article or it's, it, it has uh, news uh, or journalistic uh, me uh, methods of uh, uh, sources and facts and data, and that's not uh, always the truth. So, um, yeah, I would say that learn how to uh, uh, know the difference between opinion and facts, check information, uh, learn how to listen from the other side or from other sides, and also maybe understand that you are not always right because that's one thing that we have on social media we want to be right all the time and that's what makes us uh, far away from reaching a healthy discussion because I, I'm only concerned uh, how am I going to uh, look with this argument am I going to get some likes and get happy because I said that thing so uh, this whole environment uh, also uh, affects the way we put our ideas out there so we need to have more conversations, conversational methods, and less a statement uh, to get likes. So, yeah. Well, I, let me say that I like what you just said, which is nice. Uh, but also, uh, it's interesting that many of us, probably even if we're older, would still say, or not on social media, still believe that we, we, we want to be right even in the past. The difference is now we amplify our need to be right uh, for and Clara, I wonder whether silence and listening, is there a place for this? You, know, you, you, you started off your session with speech act theory is about how words do things to us. So, but I wonder what are your thoughts if we just turn it around and uh, in this discussion about silence and listening, I mean, what, what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, um, obviously the, this, uh or tradition of, of uh, meditation and, and silence, it, it has some, some roots in the, in the church too. Well, we are not very strong in that ourselves either. So I cannot offer you a straightforward uh, example from Hungary, but I know of such uh, movements, for example, in Finland, and they are very strong. And Finland is a country where you have obviously a lot of forests and you can have silence and you can be on your own and, and you can, you can, uh, you can, uh, be not only on your own but you try to to be with with god and you try to 
to pitch your ideas and arguments against his and then it might not seem so important or so right anymore i don't know so um and then one one more idea i just had uh, maybe another practical maybe initiative that we have in hungary is that um there is a group of young people they organize pub talks with with clergy so it's it's priests and different from different confessions and it's it's a very conversational um uh, thing it obviously goes into into streaming so it's also a media event but but it happens offline um, uh, basically mm -hmm. so it's it's people face to face but but the the participants are, are regular people and they are encouraged to ask any question to to these pastors or, or priests that they encounter and and they discuss sometimes really sensitive or or tabooistic or, or topics that are, are considered a taboo uh and and this also helps because then it 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 guides these these conversations that we do an anonymously online because we are afraid to do it offline or face to face. Just do it face to face. Create space for that. Make sure make sure that people are allowed to ask any question really, and 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 show them that 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 these people who 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 wear a robe or 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 an alb or whatever they are human beings as well. There was also a comment in the in the tech chat section on what to do with 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 hate speech or or um, or these uh, comments directed at the church at church leadership when when church issues are discussed online and and how to deal with that and maybe one solution to that problem is take it take it off the line take it take it into the public space talk about it without without uh, the the internet and then who knows it might help that's right thank you and and this goes into a very interesting uh question that was raised uh about newspapers i thought I, i'll raise this and philip you might be a good person to talk about this uh in the days before the internet letters well there's such a day right in the days before the internet letters to the editor of a newspaper were filtered not every letter would be published now, of course this links a bit to our notion of censoring, but it's not censoring, it's not editing or brevity. You know, why shouldn't an uh, online newspaper today be subject to the same responsibilities? Wouldn't that promote hope speech and not spread hate? What are your thoughts on that? I think the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, bringing that about, of course, makes it a little more difficult. But I'm struck by what my colleagues are saying here. Um, mm. one of, when people say, what does WAC do? One answer is to go into the academic jargon around communication rights. Another is to say we enable people to be seen and heard. And that's, in fact, what you find on our website at the moment. And what does it mean? I think when we talk about hope speech, that's what we're doing. We enable people to be seen and heard so that they have a voice in their own future, so that they can change their lives for the better. So hope speech, to me, to go back to your question um, is really at the bottom of um, communication rights in that sense and to use Renato's metaphor um, I think it's also about building bridges and that can be between two people or it can be between two communities or two nations but the point here is not just to have the the structure of the bridge but it's probably to get to the other side so that you can look back to show people what they're not seeing. You know, if you stand on one side of a bridge, you can see over there, but you're not seeing what's over here. Go across, meet the people, talk to them, turn them around and say, look, this is what it's like, as Renato said, from the other side, take a different perspective. And that to me is also what hope speech is about, trying to, trying to bring that about. Now, before I get Arnie to come up to give us some uh, reflections, uh, he's listening to all of you. He's practicing good listening. Uh, I just want to give you uh, an opportunity just to maybe have uh, maybe one final comment, especially about hope speech. If there's one thing that you want to say to the participants, what would you say to them about hope speech? We'll go to Renato first. Uh, well, I would say that we, first of all, uh, we need to understand that this is not an easy uh, fight or battle. So we need, to, we, we people who believe that we need to have hope 
love justice we need to uh find common support and continue this uh task which is not easy as you, uh, as we have seen here and uh, yeah just don't uh stop trying to and as we we have this we are working with this national uh youth cam campaign now and uh, we are also working with the concept of uh, planting seeds and also working with uh, the concept uh, working as little ants uh, so okay. we yes uh, so we do small things together and it creates a big change so that's what we need to get comfort uh, for right now because when you open uh, social media or the news you might uh, get scared and stop having hope about a different world a different reality uh inside the church outside the church as we uh, saw these uh, issues are also present in our communities in our parishes so uh, i would just say that we should uh, find more common uh, support as well with people that also are doing that uh, around the globe so that would be Thank it you. that's good and, and, and I know there are many questions that our participants have asked and we will collect all these questions and we will share them and perhaps we can continue the conversation. We only started the, uh, the whole conversation. Clara, how about you? What would you say uh, to us if there's one thing you wanted to say to us about Hope Speech? Um, I hope the interpreters will not hate me too much, uh, but I've been playing with two words as I, I, I've been thinking about this. You have the word for hatred, it's spite, right? And then if you use the negative, then it's despite. They don't have anything to do with each other, obviously, in the English language. But I find it really interesting that that we face all these, these uh, phenomena and, and they are overwhelming. And we have been talking about the hate part much more than the hope part, we must admit, uh, because it's difficult, as Renato have said, but we have we have the word of God, and that's the despite. So the part that, in face of all of this, there is hope that there is a word, there is a language that is stronger that than what we are hearing now. That's a good word. Thank you, uh, Clara, for that. And Philip, over to you. Your words for us, hope speech. Hate speech is very real, so I don't want to lose sight of that uh, tension between hate speech and hope speech. But I think we should remember that hate speech very rarely persuades or converts. It reinforces existing prejudice and misperception. So for me, Hope speech is any means we have of tackling those prejudices and misperceptions. Well, thank you so much for uh, your contribution. And I'm bringing in my colleague, uh, Head of Communications, Arnie, to just share with us some of his thoughts. Um, and um, we remain here as he shares with us. Thank you, Sivin, and thank you to Pauline and also our uh, panelists. Um, I began by listening, so I think I'll reflect a bit on that and then I'll offer a couple of remarks from my, from my end. So what did we hear? Well, Jocelyn reminded us that communicators are storytellers at heart and that as sort of church communicators, we are focused on sharing the good news and creating, and I like that phrase, creating a space for hope online. But she also pointed out that with a growing social media following, we may actually encounter more hate speech and we may encounter it on our home turf. That is to say in the comments, in the reflections that come as we are sharing hope. And we can't leave that unattended. And I think this is important. Philip reminded us that we are actually called to sort of guarantee some key values and to stand for them. Values like um, diversity and respect and dignity and that we should be mindful of looking at the representation of diverse groups in media. And I think that is also quite important that we never forget this. And this is not just about um, online communication, but also about other mediums like films. Clara offered us a, a, a very 
inspiring linguistic view of hate speech. Uh, we need to be mindful of what is intended, how it is received, and how it affects the listener. And that can be someone else receiving, but it can also be us. Um, and she also reminded us that this kind of destructive language goes against God's language and against the, that the church is called to be um, a voice of hope. And then finally, Renato reminded us that addressing hate speech is complex, but it's a very important assignment. And he pointed out one part, which I think is key, which is we need to equip the young and the old with media literacy. And I really appreciate what I heard from you because I think all of you are, are sort of pointing out some parts of this um, equation, shall we say. Now, let me offer one aspect in addition to this, which I think can be useful. There is an American cognitive language, linguist called George Lakoff, and he has written a lot about what he calls frames and framing as a key to understanding interaction and communication and how this can actually influence society and the public space. A frame, put very shortly, is a part of a worldview. The worldview is the conceptual framework which we use to make sense of the world, to interpret. And basically, Lakoff says, a worldview is made up of mental frames which are used to understand or interpret situations, interactions, speech. Words and concepts then can take their meaning from these frames. So the way something is framed affects or even dictates how it will be received. When you use a specific frame, also when you deny it or negate it, you may actually end up reinforcing the frame unintentionally. He takes an example of Richard Nixon who went on TV famously defending himself and said, I am not a crook. And to at least some of his listeners was probably reinforcing the sense that he was a crook. I mean, why else would he be, den be denying it? I think the same can be applied to our response to hate speech. That is to say, denying hate speech as hate speech or even labeling it as hate speech may to some extent reinforce the frame. So we need to reframe. And how do we do that? Well. I think that begins with our core values and actually our idea of what makes for a good society, for a good public space. I think we need to uh, discuss how hate speech actually undermines these values which we have agreed on, how it undermines the social contract, how it undermines society as a just place for all, how it peddles in lies and how it is ultimately an expression of violence in interaction between humans. Whereas hope speech, on the contrary, promotes a just society, a public, public space which is inclusive, which is open to all, which a, a commitment to truth and a commitment to nonviolence in our interactions. And I think one of the things we should be doing is actually gathering as many people as possible around this, around the public space which is open and inviting and equal. And I think that should be the way we frame it. And then we should let the proponents of hate speech deny that if they want, because in denying an open public space, a public space committed to truth, a public space committed to equality and diversity, they would basically be forced to use the framing of hope speech, namely a just society with an open public space. Put differently, in responding to hate speech, we should reframe using ideas and values that we believe to be fundamental, to change the soil, to influence the context within which people receive. So my suggestion as a communicator in a church-based context is really that as churches, as people of faith, as online citizens, we should strive to create this kind of hopeful soil for our online conversation, where messages of kindness can fall into the earth, and bring forth a harvest that might be 30 or 60 or 100 fold to refer to the Bible. We should invite people to associate themselves with hope and express themselves with hope in their online communication. We should let everyone with ears listen and share hope. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Arnie, indeed, for those closing remarks. And I'm sure many of you will agree with me, and I'm looking at the chat, that we could have extended today's conversations. But in view of time, we have to bring our webinar to a close. And once again, I want to extend a big thank you to our four panelists, Philip, Clara, Renato, and Joycelyn, for sharing with us what it takes to address hostility and overcome divisiveness in the public space, and for bringing also very practical examples about what churches and Christian communities are doing. Likewise, I'd like to thank so many of you who participated in this web webinar and to thank you for posing your questions, leaving comments, and also to our moderators. So this is a time to say goodbye and once again to thank all of you. Thank you very much. <laughs>